Um, hello. I want to thank everyone for coming. Today is our first segment of um, the Balsa Speaker Series. And um, my name is Jessica Eaglin. I'm president of the Black Law Students Association here at the law school. And I want to thank so much um, Professor Michael Meltzner for coming to speak today. Um, Professor Michael Meltzner graduated from Yale Law School and then went on to work at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund um, with Thurgood Marshall. He was only the second white lawyer on the staff. Um, he worked with he's worked on hundreds of lawsuits um, to integrate major southern institutions, and a um, dozen of them went to the Supreme Court and a few lower federal courts. Um, he's represented Muhammad Ali. He worked to um, to he worked he worked on the case that ended the um, Jim Crow laws with the southern hospitals. And now he has um, gone on to work as a professor at Columbia and Harvard and is currently the dean of Northwestern Law School. Um, today, he's here to speak with us about, um, his new, about his experiences and his new, or well, his book, The Making of a Civil Rights Lawyer. We have um, a couple of books that are on sale um, from The Regulator and you are available to come and buy them at the end of the speech. So thank you so much. Um, and without further ado. Well, well, first, thank you, Jessica, and, and thank you, Balsa, for uh, having me, and Duke for having me. Uh, please, if I'm not being heard, uh, someone scream and shout in the back. First, a minor correction, it's, it's uh, Northeastern Law School and in Boston. It's the only co-op law school in the United States, work-study law school. It's a fabulous place. And fortunately, they let me out of the jail called the deanship some years ago, so I don't have to go around and count the chairs and worry about the light bulbs and the budget. So uh, I'm now back to uh, just uh, teaching. I'm going to uh, tell you today uh, about five lawyers who I worked with at the Legal Defense Fund. I'm going to try and give you cameo portraits of them and from the perspective of a new lawyer, of me as I was starting out or in my relatively early years. Derek Bell, Thurgood Marshall, Jack Greenberg, Jim Nabret, a guy many of you probably have never heard of but who's a tremendously important person in the development of civil rights law and Anthony Amsterdam. Uh, but first, uh, I, I want to say, and I will, I will get moved through this at, a, I hope, a reasonable pace, because I'm really more interested in your questions than uh, hearing myself uh, talk. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, please let me have them after, after I discuss these lawyers. But before, I, I have to say that this is, for me, this is not just a matter of talking about the old days, good or whatever they were, but uh, I think there's a tremendously important linkage between the civil rights activism of the days in, in which I'm writing about and uh, the constitutional crises that uh, we confront today in this country and which uh, you, uh, as uh, beginning lawyers, are going to have a, an opportunity to participate in resolving. Um, I needn't go through, because it's not a lecture, about the FISA court or um, the rules that should govern uh, terrorism proceedings. Um, I just want to, I'm not going to go over those uh, actions of the administration that are really, I think, the source of the crisis. But I do want to point out several ways in which um, what's going on are or should be of particular interest to lawyers and law students. Um, the first is the effort on the part of the administration to redefine settled terms like, uh, like torture and the resistance uh, to uh, precedents and other and court decisions and other decisions that have defined these terms in in certain ways. Uh, this is a matter of extreme importance, I think, to the bar, and will be the subject of 
future debate and, and litigation. Second, perhaps even more important, is the effort to withdraw jurisdiction from the federal courts in not only habeas corpus proceedings, but others, which is really a way of trying to reduce the accountability of the executive branch. And thirdly, uh, interdependent with what I've mentioned, the way in which the administration takes the position that the language in Article II, which talks about the president being the commander of uh, commander in chief, trumps virtually everything else in the Constitution. Uh, these are the sources of issues which I hope many of you will have an opportunity to play a role in resolving. And uh, if there's any subtext to my, my book, it's that this is a life worth having. And it needn't be played out in a non-governmental organization, although that's the way I did it, in a nonprofit. Uh, one of the few hopeful things about what's happened in this particular area, in this national security area in recent years, is that the private bar has played a, an essential and an important role in uh, representing clients and bringing issues before the courts. So I hope. Uh, you'll see the connection between the way in which the civil rights bar used the courts and other agencies in the past and uh, the challenges of today. I started at the Legal Defense Fund in the, in the summer of 1961. I was given a desk in an already cramped office with uh, Derek Bell. He was a young black lawyer from Pittsburgh. He'd been hired by Thurgood Marshall the year before on the recommendation of William Hasty, who was then the only um, African-American federal judge in the United States. He was on the Third Circuit. Even in my first weeks of sharing an office with Derek, it was clear I was going to learn a lot more at LDF than how to practice law. He, he was later, as you all know, uh, going to become an uh, imposing and controversial figure in the legal world, a prolific author of legal treatises and provocative fables about the enigmas of race in the modern world, and not incidentally a fierce critic of the Legal Defense Fund way of doing things as well as the first Harvard uh, black law professor and the first black dean in the University of Oregon Law School, Derek would resign from both these posts in protest of faculty hiring policies. Now, we remain uh, friends to this day, but it's kind of a friendship based on the loyalty to a shared past. We've opted to avoid conflicts as old friends often uh, do, to stay away from testing the boundaries of our disagreements, although actually I think we agree on f far more, far more than we disagree about. But when I saw in my office mate in 1961 was the guy before he became an icon. Uh, with, he had an extremely welcoming demeanor. He was carefully dressed in a manner that put me to shame. He had an infectious laugh that could be heard an office or two away and a sardonic wit about the foibles of the larger society, mostly the, the white society. It was about Derek a mixture of critical seriousness and good humor, though it was often difficult to tell which feature dominated at any particular time. Connie Motley, who, who worked most closely with him, that's Judge Constance Baker Motley, I remember as Connie, um, would write, Derek has never worn life as a loose garment. And in fact, if he got a little preachy or garrulous as he would, his delightfully outspoken wife, Jewel, might be heard not so gently calling him back from the brink of excess. Um, Jewel knew her man. And uh, two, days la two decades later, when Derek would take up one of the most unusual protests in America, American academic history on behalf of the female black law teachers, uh, 
It was, I thought, as much homage to his remarkable wife as a provocative political intervention. One of the first things I learned about Derek was that he had decided to leave his job in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice when his supervisors insisted he resign his two-buck membership in the NAACP on the ground that it amounted to a conflict of interest with his responsibilities to enforce federal rights laws. It took courage to leave the department when he was just starting out in professional life and was one of its very few black lawyers, especially when all those veteran civil rights figures for whom he sought, from whom he sought advice suggested going along with a policy so as to help his career and ensure his ability to do good later on. He never conveyed bitterness to me about having left the Department of Justice. Rather, the experience, like most of his travails later in life, seemed to leave him in a better place professionally and personally. The department's insistence on Derek's resignation from the NAACP illustrates the caution with which official Washington embraced integration in the early 60s. Um, notice that they tre treated um, a civil rights assertion and the, an opposition thereto as, as equal matters, matters in, entitled to uh, equal uh, uh, dignity. This is one of the reasons why in the first half of the 1960s, relations between the civil rights community and the Kennedy and even early Johnson administrations, even though these were by far the best administrations so far, were so problematic. But um, it wasn't, this attitude was not limited to Derek. In 1960, a, a fellow named Howard Glickstein, uh, who would later become the uh, general counsel of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, applied for a job at the Civil Rights uh, Division. And he interviewed with uh, the lawyer, Harold Ace Tyler, later a federal judge, who ran the division in the Eisen late, late Eisenhower administration. And Ty Tyler hired Glickstein for the job. But he said, you have to resign your membership in the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, Glickstein sat in his office, and he waited for, for more. And, Finally, he said, well, what about my, my membership in the NAACP? And Tyler said, well, that'll have to go, too. Glickstein pointed out that he was a lifetime member of the NAACP and was not sure how he could give this up except by jumping out a window. Later in 1961, um, uh, the year I began work at LDF, I was shocked to learn that President Kennedy had nominated my boss, Thurgood Marshall, for an important federal judgeship. So it was the Second Circuit. Robert Kennedy had first refused to offer Marshall a seat on the Court of Appeals, um, and only uh, uh, relented after hard lobbying by an influential black Democrat. He thought Marshall would be better as a trial judge. And apparently, RFK did not see Marshall's appointment as a way of grooming the first black Supreme Court justice, the way Lyndon Johnson would view his 1965 appointment of Marshall to replace Archie Cox as US Solicitor General. It was plain when Johnson nominated Thurgood Marshall for that job where he was going to go next if Johnson had an opportunity to do something about it. Kennedy plainly expected little more than some marginal political gain from the appointment of the black lawyer. And even that gain, he was sure, would cost him political capital in the Senate. Certainly, he was not expecting Marshall to become an influential jurist. And this dynamic of fear that action, actions in favor of northern civil rights figures would redound to uh, pain and suffering in the Congress was a, a, a theme of the early um, well, of the Kennedy administration, even though it was by far the most friendly administration uh, we, we'd ever had. At any rate, Marshall's uh, judgeship began a new phase in one of the greatest of all legal careers, beginning a course of government service that would only end 30 years later when failing health uh, required him to resign from the Supreme Court. Uh, LDF would always be associated with Marshall's leadership in the Brown case, 
But as 1962 began, it would have to adjust to new leadership and novel forms of legal, legal work that would dramatically change what lawyers asked of courts and the way courts might respond. Class actions were a small item before this period. And in fact, it was the civil rights movement, for example, that transformed class action practice. The rights of minorities were about to be transformed from, from actions that were criminal under state law to suddenly actions which were not only protected by law, but, they, but were privileged. Uh, one of Marshall's biographers, Marsh, Mark Tushnet, writes that in the years between the second Brown case, that's 55, which set the snail's pace of desegregation as old deliberate speed, and, and the time when um, Marshall left, um, that he mainly focused on fundraising and organizational issues and left the actual uh, litigation-related legal work to a staff he trusted. That's certainly an accurate description of what I observed in the brief time I worked under Marshall. And it su suggests one of the great joys of working for LDF, and I, I think if this is true of many public interest organizations, the opportunity early in one's career to make a decision of importance in, 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 in lawsuits. LDF allowed me to argue a death penalty appeal before the United States Supreme Court during my second year of practice. Um, this was so early in my career that I needed special permission from the Supreme Court to, to be able to do it. And this was a time where most of my law school classmates were sort of begging their, their senior partners for the opportunity to sit in client meetings or to watch depositions. This was a period where I loved going to cocktail parties. Though he wasn't present every day, Marshall was still a looming presence at LDF offices in New York. He had the last word on issues of consequence, and he made his view, views known, though often in his trademark enigmatic style. And he could materialize out of nowhere to read a brief or a set of pleadings. As almost everyone who has worked closely with Marshall can attest, he used jokes and stories as a way to connect with people as well as to convey a point of view. The jokes especially made him, him flesh and blood, and uh, it, they are for me an antidote to his, his sort of a bloodless deification in certain circles after he became a justice. In, in one memorable story that I doubt he told later in life, he underscored his own notoriety and also poked fun at a kind of competitor, the flamboyant Harlem politician Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, Marshall recounted to uh, staff members who were sitting in his office one day how an elder, the elderly African-American elevator operator in a New York residential apartment building had greeted him. You know, they used to have people who actually drove elevators. Um, well, this, this fellow greeted uh, Marshall with familiarity and a sort of knowing wink when uh, Marshall got in the elevator and asked to be taken to a certain female residence floor. An hour or so later, uh, uh, the same guy in the same elevator car took him back to the lobby. And Thurgood wanted to make a hasty exit, so he sort of mumbled a quick good night. And as, but as he was leaving the elevator car, the operator replied in kind, and he said, and good night to you, Congressman Powell. <laughs> Jack Greenberg, who took over uh, the Legal Defense Fund's reins from Marshall, dubbed this period, the first half of the 60s, the era of trench warfare. The lawyers were engaged in an agonizingly slow battle to eliminate the vestiges of legal segregation, to enforce the rights won in court, and to protect their own position from attack. I mean, the strategy of states, especially Alabama and Virginia, was to maximize the demands on organizations like the Legal Defense Fund, so they had very little time and money left to bring affirmative um, litigation. As in the trench warfare of World War I, it seemed as if both sides would be frozen, immobilized forever in their dug-in positions. As a leader, Greenberg was totally different from Marshall. You know, first of all, he was white, but it's remarkable how in those days, 
how very little comment was made of, about this. It's only later that this seemed to become something of an issue. Um, Greenberg was direct, Marshall was cryptic, orderly. Uh, Greenberg was orderly and unflappable. Uh, Marshall was unpredictable and, and mercurial. Uh, Thurgood Marshall was a social animal. He, he was comfortable with all stratas of society, uh, janitors and Wall Streeters. He's the center of attention in every gathering. His, his physical si his size was imposing, and he know, knew how, how to um, uh, use it. Greenberg was short um, and didn't always seem at ease in unstructured situations. This was an aspect of him, his leadership, that sometimes got him in trouble with feisty, ideologically sensitive um, young lawyers. Greenberg would say, I'm not very demonstrative externally or internally. That's a quote from him. And when someone asked him if as a very young lawyer he'd been nervous arguing one of the Brown cases, he sounded like a John Wayne character uh, in, in his response. Um, he, he, he said, I just calmly did what I had to do. And just see John Wayne saying that in a movie. Um, he had a sense of humor, but if you ever told me a joke, I, I can't remember it. And you can see I, there are many Thurgood Marshall stories, I, maybe too many I, re, I remember. Um, it was hard to believe that Greenberg, uh, a boyish looking fellow, had commanded a landing craft at Iwo Jima where 6,821 Americans and 21,000 Japanese had died fighting over 36 days in World War II. They fought over eight square miles in 1945, when I was eight years old. Uh, Greenberg had a youthful look, uh, an open look, and it was, it was impossible, it was possible to imagine him more a peer than a boss. But in fact, he was full of iron and very much in charge. Both he and Marshall ran LDF in a fairly traditional way. Policy decisions came down from the top. Uh, though we had enormous control over our own cases, this was not a democracy. Um, there was little in the way of organized talk about goals and objectives in the early 1960s. No one had any reason to doubt that integration was the end sought. Uh, litigation strategy consisted of a refined version of the approach followed by LDF in the 20 years of planned class action cases that led to the victory in Brown. And the aim was to expand Brown's view of equal protection uh, to every corner of American life and most importantly to enforce it, uh, really a much more difficult and demanding task than just winning a judicial statement of principle. One of the first things that I was asked to do at LDF was to help prepare the main section of a petition for writ of certiorari. Um, as you know, legalese for uh, a request that the Supreme Court consider and then set aside a lower court's ruling. Since 1925, when Congress finally acceded to the wishes of the justices, the court has had virtually total control over its docket. And again, as you know, it, it approves only a tiny percentage of, of requests for review, and even fewer now than it did even a decade ago. The case in question involved 187 South Carolina high school students and college students who, quote, peaceably assembled at the site of the state government, the Capitol in Columbia. They were protesting segregation but they were convicted of breach of the peace after they failed to disperse when the police ordered them to do so. I reviewed the file that was sent to me by our, North, our South Carolina cooperating attorneys. I thought I did it with great care. I drafted a petition calling what the students had done the very essence of protected speech, and I emphasized uh, the vagueness of the state breach of, the, uh, of peace law. Later, I conclude that Jim Nabert, who was assigned to, to break me in, who was my supervisor, was the most thorough lawyer I encountered in four decades of legal practice but, and, and teaching. But even at this early stage, it was obvious that Jim, while, while no nitpicker, was extremely deliberate and cautious about his uh, legal opinions. 
um, born, he was born to the work. He was kind of a civil rights diaper baby. He was in the first grade when his dad argued uh, a landmark voting case, uh, broadening the opportunity for African Americans to vote in Oklahoma. Uh, James Neighbor Jr., that was his dad, um, I taught the first civil rights law course in an American law school at Howard. He, he was later uh, dean of the Howard Law School and president of the university. Um, and many movement figures of the period were family friends. At college, Jim watched his father argued, uh, argue uh, one of the Brown cases, one of the five Brown cases, Bowling v. Sharp, the District of uh, Columbia case. After a stint in the Army, it was natural for him to find his way to LDF where Thurgood Marshall declared to anyone who would listen that Jim's job was to be low man on the totem pole and he was to be called boy. That's Thurgood Marshall for you. This was 1959. Jim became the fourth member of Marshall's staff. I, when I was hired two years later, the number had climbed to six. Um, although it was plain that Jim was far more than two years ahead of me in savvy, he never made me feel like a rookie. Uh, but for the the two days he looked over my argument and supporting papers, I was a real mess. Um, my wife, who was here, uh, had, had to put up with a very grouchy, uh, um, unpleasant uh, a guy. Um, and I was secretly glad that she was working hard that year as a teacher to a group of adolescent mental patients and had her own distractions to cope with. The longer Jim delayed in summoning me to his office, the more certain I was I had chosen the wrong profession. I assume several of you have at least had that fleeting thought at one time or another, maybe when you're called on and as first year students. I certainly did. Um, only a few months earlier, I'd been digging with archaeologists in, in uh, the Negev desert and carrying an Uzi uh, on nighttime guard duty to, uh, to warn the real soldiers if raiders were crossing the border. And I thought, I just must be just too removed from current developments uh, for this work. Did I really remember any con, con law? Uh, had I said enough in this petition for a search area? Or was it too much to overcome the long odds of getting a review granted? So when, when Nabrit uh, finally returned the draft, he came, he came to my office, which was a shocker, and he folded his six plus feet into a chair and he was the very definition of casual. He told me some anecdote about a trivial office incident. And because we all smoked in those days, he lit up something called a King Sano, which was a cigarette with a filter about as thick as a slice of pumpernickel bread, which made you feel that maybe it wasn't as bad for you. As it, as it was. So I, you know, I relaxed, and, but I should have been on, on my guard. Uh, Jim's lungs strained to inhale, and he spoke in a voice so low that I had to lean toward him across the desk to hear. And then he stubbed out the smoke in my ashtray, and he adopted a characteristic pose, holding his right hand against his chin with a pencil kind of pointing up to the ceiling. And he said he'd made only a, a, a couple of minor editorial changes. I'd done well. Um, he, he thought I might develop a few points here and there, but he praised my constitutional analysis. And I silently rejoiced, thank God, and thank God for Alex Bickle, my, my uh, esteemed constitutional law teacher and the person who had recommended me to Thurgood Marshall for the job. Um, and then he said, but there's just one thing. And I said, oh? Yeah, well, it's a big thing, though he, he made clear that there was no reason I should have known about it. But it turns out the Supreme Court of the United States had a rule, it's been changed since for your benefit, um, that it wouldn't accept a petition for writ of certiorari unless the clerk of the lower court certified the, the whole record of proceedings as accurate. In effect, the clerk had to sign off at the, with a certificate on the record saying it was a true copy of the proceedings below. You don't have one of these, uh, Jim said. You better get it. He yawned and 
he seemed casual still, and he said, but you better move fast if it isn't done before the time for appeal runs out, which was like four days. The case is over, and each of our clients may end up having to serve time in jail. Welcome to civil rights practice. Then he asked me where I wanted to go for lunch. And finally, Tony Amsterdam. Anybody here, here know of Tony Amsterdam? Anybody don't know who Tony Amsterdam is? Wow. Well, an important law, law figure. Maybe you'll know a little bit more after this. Um, he, um, within a month of my arrival, it became part of my job to share up uh, to, to deal with my share of the pile of letters we got every week from prisoners requesting legal assistance. These letters were easy to recognize from the envelopes. They were addressed often in pencil to NAACP New York or Lawyer Marshall. And the return address was a post office box, usually in some rural town. The letters themselves were usually scrawled on lined paper and too often incoherent. The prisoners had no law libraries, and most had such a weak grasp on literacy that they couldn't have taken advantage, of law taken advantage of law books if they'd been available. Not all of the writers were mentally competent. Many of the letters were um, also addressed to the White House or to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, and some were even addressed to the Pope as well as to NAACP New York or Lawyer Marshall. The prisoners listed their grievances, constitutional rights disregarded, convictions because of race despite innocence of all charges. They told confused, partial stories of how a lying co-defendant or a bad cop or bigoted judge or sleazy lawyer was responsible for, for their incarceration. Often the facts were so tangled it took imagination to grasp what the inmate was really complaining about. Most of the letters were pathetic attempts to find reasons to upset jury verdicts of conviction, long sentences, or even condemnation to death. More often than I expected, though, I heard a ring of truth in these allegations. And if I sensed something worth investigating, I wrote the prisoner. Eventually, I was able to get delivery of court files, and that ended matters most of the time. Uh, the trail ended. The inmate's first letter had been misleading or overstated or it had omitted crucial facts or it had just plain lied about what had happened or, and worst of all, told a painful set of truths for which there was no legal remedy. Uh, by writing to the prisoner, uh, I had caused my name to pass through the, the inmate system and I was secretly proud of at least that. And I would get mail also addressed to me personally with copies to Jagger Hoover, the president, and the pope. Uh, sometimes, however, the claim checked out, and I found myself in Jack Greenberg's office asking him to let me or some other staff lawyer add the case to our load. He raised some pointed questions, but almost always let me pursue the matter if he glimpsed a sign of legal issues of any substance. Once or twice every few years, the process produced a winning case and a feeling on my part that no matter what else had happened, my life as a lawyer was worth the cost. In 1967, for example, um, uh, after some digging, uh, uh, I learned that the police had improperly taken a statement from a defendant and realizing they could not use it in evidence, I had brought two journalists into the suspect's cell and let them seek the incriminating answers and then tried to use them. Tony Amsterdam and I wrote a pauper's petition to the Supreme Court, and to our amazement, the court reversed the conviction without even hearing oral argument. I worked with Tony on many cases from 1963 on. Although he is better known as the chief architect of the capital punishment strategy that led to Furman v. Georgia. His contribution to vast numbers of important civil rights cases has gone largely unappreciated beyond the circle of LDF insiders. Um, I mark the hours spent in his company as the highest points in over 40 years of uh, legal practice. 
He combined overwhelming brain power across the disciplines and true compassion for the underdog with vast energy packed in his rail thin body. Amsterdam couldn't, could have accepted the easy life of a celebrated scholar. Instead, he dedicated himself to using his knowledge in action to protect, protect values he cherished and clients he thought oppressed. His work habits were fascinating. When I first met him, we were only in our 20s, but he conveyed the accumulated wisdom of a much older man. His office in those days was located in the University of Pennsylvania Law School's library. Um, he'd gone there to teach in 1962 after clerking for Justice Frankfurter and serving briefly as an assistant United States attorney. And it was easy to imagine, to playfully imagine, legal principles being pumped into his office from some furnace room in the basement. Um, I thought I worked hard, but it was immediately clear that compared to him, I was a part-timer. He sat behind a mountain of law books of every description and every recent decision, thousands a, a year, ran, reached by every federal circuit court. Um, he, he regularly slept but a few hours a night, and he left the impression of having skimmed at least all of those decisions and also of rarely leaving the premises. Be because he found it hard to say no to requests for assistance, he had to adopt a set of quietly evasive tactics to get time to do his work. He had a day job. He was a law teacher, a prolific scholar, and he worked with uh, LDF on many cases. Um, and then there were the never-ending list of phone calls uh, from lawyers who wanted a brief consultation. He never took a fee, as far as I know, for this work. He would carry drafts of legal documents in what must have been a dozen red pens and disappear for several days. He'd be unreachable. And then all of a sudden, he'd materialize magically early uh, one morning, and he'd smack down on my desk a revised version of a brief or pleading. I tried to remember at the end of this case if I tried to think that I shared the lawyering here, but. There was amazing stuff in those, in those drafts. Um, and now, just to sum him up, in, in 1973, when I was completing a book in which I described him in glowing terms, the book about the death penalty called Cruel and Unusual, my famously skeptical editor, Joe Fox of Random House, Fox had been Truman Capote's editor on In Cold Blood and Anthony Lewis's editor you know, for Gideon's Trumpet. Fox was paging through my manuscript, and he looked up at me. He deadpanned. Does this guy have any faults you know of? He was telling me he didn't like anybody looking this good. Everybody has feet of clay, was what this cynical New York editor was conveying by saying, does this guy have any faults you know of? I was really stuck. Well, Joe, you know he has a degree in art history, was all I could come up with. And he actually likes those ridiculous 16th and 17th century European Mannerist paintings. Fox looked at me longer than I liked. He deeply inhaled one of the camel cigarettes that ultimately killed him, and then turned the page. Thank you. Well, I hope something of these magnificent lawyers came through. Um, are there any questions or comments? Yes. I had a question about your comment earlier in the beginning about the role of private law firms. I'm sorry. The, the role of private law firms in yes. historical terms and also going forward. And that's obviously something of value to folks here, most of whom are going to want to work in private law firms for one reason or the other. Wondering, one, what you see that role being in the coming battles that we mentioned on the uh, on sort of constitutional civil rights and FISA court issues, terrorism. And two, what could junior associates, first year associates, in terms of a change affecting that role, or even even before that, choosing firms that they think are going to be able to play a role? Well, I think the first thing to recognize is that junior associates have more power than they probably think they have. Uh, um, one of the aspects of both, law, I think, of both law schools and law firms is that they are keen to get a sense of where the new people coming in are. And so if, uh, if 
new hires are interested in, instead of, in, in such issues and are bringing something from their experience in law school about those issues, I think there are people who are eager to listen. That doesn't mean that these law firms are going to turn on a dime just because um, some new associate is interested in a particular case, but I think it, it would be quite uh, un unfortunate to underplay the importance of simply the cultural values that are being brought in. I think it's a long history of uh, law students conveying where, where they think the profession is and where they think their careers are. And the only thing that stops that is, I, I think there's a lot of self-censorship, which I hope is, is resisted. Uh, with respect to these firms, uh, I think this is, um, there has been a fairly spontaneous movement. It obviously doesn't apply to all firms, and that means that, again, when you're looking for a job, you've got to ask yourself, do you really, do you really want to spend your time in, in a firm with a culture that may not be yours? Um, I think a n the number of firms that have gotten involved, despite the fact that many of the people who pay the bills are... Uh, representatives of large corporations which may have totally different or feel they have totally different interests is rather impressive. To be sure, lots of law professors and others and NGOs have been involved in these cases. But the number of uh, law firm lawyers at all levels uh, is real. And as for junior associates, well, you know, uh, the uh, the Waxmans of Wilmer Hale may be the people whose name is first on the brief, but you can be sure that the newcomers, especially when they've expressed an interest, are going to be playing a role. And I think those roles are transformative. I'm quite surprised at the number of firms that have gotten involved myself. It, and it plays into my notion, which is public interest practice should not be thought of as you have to go to work for this good guy organization. It's a way of life. It's a way of looking at the law. And there are so many ways of playing that out that I don't think uh, that anyone, you can take almost any legal job and find a way to express that if you want to. Yeah. Um, to revisit the point you made about how policy used to be that you couldn't card-carrying member of one of these civil rights organizations that still work for the government. Mm -hmm. What about the situation today, in your opinion? Um, is working for the government a good way to try and do civil rights law where you might end up having to attack the government's position or defend it? Well, I think it's very context-specific. To be sure, there are incredible skills that one would acquire. And on the other hand, there are lines you don't, particular individuals will not want to cross. But I wouldn't categorically reject any kind of work, well, very little, um, both because uh, often a governmental agency, for example, which has been doing things that you don't think are legally required or disapprove of politically, may be influenced by your point of view. I suppose the classic instance is, as a often third-year students, uh, various law schools are in my office saying, should I become a prosecutor? more in the past than now, but, and I never said no, because prosecutors have an enormous capacity to, to do good things. I think the same thing is obviously true of being a government lawyer. On the other hand, you know, acting against your conscience has its consequences. Yes? Um, you mentioned um, issues at the beginning of your talk um, that are kind of abound today, but what do you consider the most important civil rights issue? I heard, I think, on the news that Condoleezza Rice was saying that the president wasn't trying to change the Geneva Convention. He was just trying to clarify something. And so, I mean, there are a lot of issues out there, but there's not that salient issue that you, that you dealt with. So for, for our generation, what would you consider? Well, I think there is that salient issue, and, but, you know, how you define it is, and I think it's basically this, this effort to, to um, reduce the role of Congress and the courts to virtually nothing in a, in a period of emergency, which is also at the same time defined as endless. And now, whether or not one treats that as a civil rights issue, 
labels it that way, I don't know, but from, I think it's the primary issue of our times. Uh, of classic civil rights issues, uh, I've felt and write about the importance of developing a, a realistic and powerful poverty law. And um, I had this glimmer of hope for about 10 seconds in the Katrina aftermath that people would get that message. Um, and of, of course, it doesn't seem to have happened. But I think that's the leading domestic issue and has been for a long time. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it.